Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we will start the last lecture of uh, Professor Dong Amnion from Busan National University. Today, he will teach the alternatives and future perspectives. Uh, please welcome him. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so uh, this is the last lecture. Uh, so today is the last day of uh, this school and this is my last lecture. So uh, up to now, uh, if we summarize the topics, then first I discussed about Hawking radiation and uh, Bekenstein Hawking entropy and about semi-critical and evaporating black hole, uh, I mean geometry and some details. So based on these uh, fundamental uh, foundations, uh, we dis discussed about the information loss paradox. Especially, this is very difficult in terms of quantum information theory. So, uh, I provided several arguments why um, information loss problem is complicated. And um, so, I provided several ways to understand this, including AMPS argument or uh, monogamy of entanglement um, argument, and so on. So. Um, so uh, we found that uh, such a, um, assumptions, uh, unitarity and local field theory, general relativity, and um, Bekenstein entropy is the same as Boltzmann entropy, and so on. So such an assumptions are inconsistent. So then we need to find some alternatives. So uh, yesterday we I, I discussed about several uh, options. For example, one may believe information is lost, or um, one may believe there is a um, violation of general relativity near the horizon scale, so called the firewall, or there may be some non-local um, interactions between inside and outside. So I discussed about the ERPL conjecture and. Maybe uh, recently it is very uh, rapidly developing uh, field from the string theory community. So uh, today, I, what I will discuss is uh, about some another alternatives, including the um, including the, the remnant picture and its variations. And also, um, what I didn't discuss is that um, if we eventually understand the information as paradox, then one another important uh, question is about the infall problem. So if you are an infalling observer, then what will you see? So in about this question, we need to think about that. Um, so today, what I will talk uh, is first of um, this is about the regular black holes. So um, I will explain what is the regular black holes. And uh, also uh, there can be some quantum gravitational treatment of the resolution of singularity. So even though the singularities are not resolved, uh, maybe we can describe the singularity using the wave function approach. Uh, so uh, these are, so, uh, it's a, um, uh, about the uh, non perturbative uh, uh, quantum gravity issue. So maybe it's a little bit um, different from the generic um, approach in the string theory side. Uh, so I, I think uh, so still there are many subtle issues, but still there are many researchers about this field. So in some day, maybe some uh, struggling about um, singularity based on non perturbative quantum gravity may be useful to understand the information of paradox. So, um, and so I, I, what, what I am saying, is, so I'm not saying that uh, these research uh, issues are uh, the only way to understand singularities. Uh, that is uh, what I am not saying. So what I would like to say is that there are such uh, interesting um, research topics. So if you briefly remember that, then maybe uh, in some day this will be helpful to you. So uh, based on the singularity resolution issue, I will move to the black hole remnant scenario. And uh, as an uh, extreme side of the remnant picture, so I will, I will explain why the remnant scenario need to be criticized. And then um, I will discuss about the baby universe issue and it is uh, somehow related to the information loss paradox. And finally, if time is permitted, then I will discuss about, about some uh, future perspectives very shortly. Okay, so uh, let's go to this question. So if one experiences the information loss paradox, then this means that um, one experiences the entire uh, evaporation process of the black holes. Then one needs to explain everything about the black holes. Then uh, one needs to explain both inside and outside dynamics. 
for example, if you can explain the page call, and if you can explain how can information comes out from the black hole, then maybe you can say that you can explain the outside dynamics consistently. However, uh, still, uh, what, uh, there remains one question. So for an inferring observer, what he or she will observe? Uh, that is the question. So uh, the inferring so the, there can be several possibilities. The inferring observer will uh, be dissolved and eventually um, they will be uh, escape in terms of the hooking radiation or um, some other way. <laughs> I don't know what is the case. So uh, the question is anyway, for an inferring observer, what he or she will observe? Uh, that is the infer problem. And uh, indeed, in the last stage of the, the political information paradox, this, this problem must be um, uh, resolved in, in the end. So uh, about this possibility, so about this question, there can be in principle, so in my opinion, there can be two possibilities. So in the first possibility, uh, maybe you can say that um, near the singularity, there is no corresponding classical geometry or um, not necessarily the singularity. So whatever, if there is a, a firewall, then maybe even near the horizon scale, um, you may say that there is no corresponding classical geometry. Okay, so uh, uh, there are some alternative ways. So uh, maybe uh, there is a quantum gravitation corrections and this may provide a um, space-time extension beyond the singularity. So um, this means that um, if the space-time causal structure is extended beyond the singularity, then of course uh, the corrections are quantum gravitational or whatever it is, but um, still we can keep the extended um, uh, almost classical space-time structure. So then we will see an extended semi-classical space-time. So uh, there may be two alternative interpretations about the inferring observers. So the first version is genuine quantum gravitational, quantum mechanical description. And the second one is somehow effectively classical description. And I don't know which is the correct way, uh, but um, first, so I will first discuss about the second possibility because it's a more uh, familiar and related to the general relativity community. So let's discuss about this side. So if you choose this uh, option, then uh, causal structure must be, can be expanded beyond the uh, singularity and we, we will obtain a modified space-time, uh, which do not have the singularity. So this picture is called by the regular black holes. So, you know, in uh, English world, uh, regular is a little bit normal <laughs> and singular is a, a little bit very special. Um, however, in black hole physics, uh, singular, singularity is more normal, and if there is no singularity, then space-time is entirely regular, which is very abnormal in some sense. So when you say the regular black holes, um, it, it doesn't mean normal black holes, but it, it is somehow abnormal black holes, which doesn't have any singularity. So uh, the question is, can you avoid the singularity within the classical description? Uh, see, even though the classical description is uh, um, makes sense, does make sense, but um, uh, can we find an example that there is no singularity? So indeed, for the um, uh, in terms of the uh, GR general relativity, this is really uh, difficult because there is a famous uh, singularity theorem. This is a very famous paper by Hawking and Penrose, uh, which was published in 1970. So this is a very famous paper. And, and probably, um, I'm not 100% sure, but uh, maybe Penrose got the Nobel Prize uh, relating the singularity theorem and gravitational collapse and such um, uh, topics. So in that sense, this um, paper is very uh, important, even in terms of the astrophysics and Nobel Prize and so okay. <laughs> so, but uh, one point is that, and before uh, Hawking and Penrose published this paper, there were several versions of the uh, singularity theorems. And uh, you know, uh, this paper, 1970 paper, uh, is um, somehow um, very, very um, generalized, the generalized version of the uh, proof. Of, uh, but this means that it seems mathematically quite um, complicated. So, if you read uh, the, this abstract, the words are quite um, quite uh, complicated, but um, anyway, if we uh, digest uh, the, um, the singularity theorem, uh, then um, the conclusion is that what what we need 
so in order to prove the existence of the singularity, what we need is the following four conditions. So the first one is the uh, general relativity as a working uh, theory. The second one is the causal structure. By causal structure, we mean is uh, whether the past can decide the future. So of course, um, you, we need a more uh, rigorous mathematical and topological statement, but intuitively speaking, what I'm saying is uh, causal structure means whether the past can decide the future or not. If the past cannot decide some future, then we cannot say that there must be a singularity. But if a future must be decided by the past data, so then um, we may say something about the um, existence of the singularity. And the third assumption is about the energy condition. Of course, it's also very uh, um, various definitions about the energy conditions, but um, intuitively speaking, uh, the essential is whether the matter attract or um, repulse. So th this is the, about the energy condition. And, and uh, you may ask, um, uh, so you so how to measure the energies, either time-like directions or uh, space-like directions or null directions, or uh, you will integrate over some some time-like or null geodesics or not. So um, based on these observ observations, um, you may define various notions of the energy condition, but the essential feature is whether the matter attract or repulse. This is about the energy condition. So then finally, the initial condition is necessary. If all the matters are moving um, randomly, then of course nothing is focused and no singularity will be formed. So the question is whether the matter collapses or expands. So if matter collapses sufficiently and or matter expands sufficiently, so by sufficiently, what I mean is whether there is a trapped surface or not. If there is a trapped surface, then um, uh, then uh, um, if uh, it collapses, then there is a future singularity. If it expands, then um, there is a past singularity. So I mean the initial singularity of the universe. So so these four uh, conditions are necessary to prove the mathematical theorem, singularity theorem. And uh, you know all mathematical theorems are something like that. If you assume a very strong assumption, then you can easily prove it. Uh, if the the assumption becomes weaker and weaker, then it becomes very complicated to prove the theory. So, uh, so in in this version, um, so this is the most simplified assumption. Based on very simplified assumptions, we could confirm that there is a mathematical uh, singularities. However, uh, probably in my opinion, the most popular version. So, so I mean, the hooking panels theorem is more mathematically uh, complicated. So more popular version of the singularity theorem uh, is something like this. So uh, in my knowledge, this uh, theorem was proven by uh, Penrose in 1960 some years. And um, I took this um, um, sentences from the famous book of Hawking and Ellis in 1973. So uh, based on um, um, this theorem, of course, the GR was assumed. And based on GR, there are three assumptions. One is uh, energy condition. So, so R K K greater than zero for all null vectors K. So this condition is known to be null energy condition. The second one is that there is a non-compact Cauchy surface. So what do you mean by non-compact Cauchy surface? So of course, uh, I hope you search the books and vigorous references, or even Wikipedia, you can search it. So, uh, the, but the non, uh, existence of a non-compact compact Cauchy surface uh, is the same as the global hyperbolicity. And what is the global hyperbolicity? Uh, that is, uh, for a given initial condition, uh, you can decide the order space-time. So that, that is the, global, the meaning of the global hyperbolicity, and it seems a very uh, reasonable assumption because um, our physical intuition is that from the initial data, it must um, be able to decide the future hypersurface. So uh, global hyperbolicity means the uh, past data can decide the future. And the, finally, the world is the, there is a closed trapped surface. So uh, what is a trapped surface? Uh, trapped surface means that, as I mentioned in my third lecture, uh, if um, um, 
if the aerial radius decreases for all directions, not only in going direction, but also outgoing direction, then uh, there is the trap, trap surface. And, uh, you know, um, if there is a trap surface, then there must be a boundary. So, there, I mean, there must be an outermost, outermost, uh, the most, I mean, outermost um, trap surface should exist. And that uh, surface is called by the apparent horizon. So, so um, indeed, if I say more intuitively, then um, um, I can summarize by the four assumptions. So first one is the general relativity. The other is global hypervelocity. So past can decide the future sufficiently. And third one is the null energy condition. So uh, by the null energy condition, what uh, we can imagine is that uh, this includes um, um, positive kinetic energy uh, matters. So usually, um, Kinetic energy must be positive. So, null energy condition includes uh, positive energy uh, kinetic terms, and also uh, there can be the vacuum energy. So, distal space or anti distal space. So, uh, especially null energy condition means uh, which includes um, digital vacuum, positive vacuum energy. So, um, null energy condition covers uh, such two methods either cosmological constant or um, positive kinetic energy. But this does not include the negative kinetic energy contributions. Uh, that usually violates the null energy condition. And uh, if there is a null energy condition, then there is the incoming or outgoing negative energy flux, negative kinetic energy flux. Uh, but a null energy condition um, um, uh, does not um, consider such a negative energy flux. And um, in order to obtain such a negative energy flux, um, there are several ways. The first way is to introduce the negative kinetic term, so-called the ghost term. But uh, you know, in the nature, the, such a ghost is the, uh, illegal. So you can use it, but um, you can use it and you can write a paper, but uh, it is illegal in the nature because it is unstable. And, um, and then maybe there are several legal ways in some sense. The first way is to introduce the energy momentum tensor. Uh, renormalize the energy momentum tensor. For example, if you turn on the Hawking radiation, then there is an incoming negative energy flux which violates the null energy condition. So, so that is the legal uh, way to derive such a negative energy flux. But the problem is that you cannot control freely uh, because if we, it's a realistic field, then you can in principle control. Um, so you make more negative energy or less. Negative energy, but if it is about the renormalized energy momentum tensor, then in principle you cannot uh, control freely. So it is decided by the geometry. Therefore, so it is very restricted. Maybe one exceptional case is the so called the Galilean field. So um, uh, this comes from the modified gravity theory. So, uh, of course, uh, Galileans are not uh, motivated from the string theory side. However, if you at once you accept the Galileans, then it violates a null energy condition, but it's a perturbatively stable, as I know. So, um, so in, in modified gravity side, you have some freedom to choose the null energy, violation of the null energy condition. Anyway, and then the final condition is the existence of the apparent horizon. So at once there is an apparent horizon, then uh, matter starts to collapse sufficiently, so um, horizon is generated. So if we assume these four contents, then there must be a singularity. Can I ask a question? So uh, yes, yes. The Galileon, is it something appearing the non-relativity or? Uh, so, um, it's nothing so to do with non-relativity. Uh, uh, of course, uh, it, it is within the general relativistic um, uh, framework. Um, but the, the kinetic term is quite uh, um, non-trivial. So in, in my in my knowledge, it's not about round by square, like a, a term, but it, it's a more complicated, non-minimally coupled um, kinetic term. But, but still, uh, you can uh, st study within the uh, general relativistic framework, of course. Uh, okay, so uh, then uh, in order to avoid the singularity, uh, one needs to deny one of the assumptions. Of course, uh, I, I think uh, you need to keep general relativity. You cannot deny this one. Uh, and also, if there is no apparent horizon, then it is no black hole. It, it may be a star, but um, it is not um, a black hole-like geometry. And there may be no um, dominant Hawking radiation if there is no apparent horizon. 
Therefore, yeah. you are yeah. talking about the, some singularity in the classical geometry, not the, some quantum or. Right, 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 right. So, um, so what I'm saying is, uh, uh, if uh, there is some quantum gravitational corrections or whatever it is, I don't know, but uh, um, if it explains uh, the singularity free geometry, then um, we need to uh, effectively um, deny some of the assumptions. But um, I think uh, if you are still studying the black holes, then uh, you should keep number one and number four. There must be an upfront horizon, there must be a general relativity. Then um, also, um, you can introduce the method that violates normal energy condition, um, but maybe it's very easy to be illegal. So therefore, uh, can there be any causal way to avoid the singularity? What I mean is, if is there any model that um, uh, satisfies one, three, four, but uh, by uh, denying the global hyperbolicity, can there be any regular solution? So um, this question was done by the famous uh, Bardin in 1968. So this, this solution is called by the Bardin black hole. So yesterday I searched the reference of Bardin uh, and I want you to uh, copy and paste his paper to this slide, but I noticed that his paper, uh, this work uh, was not published indeed. <laughs> but uh, this was uh, presented in a proceeding book probably. So it's not published in the journal. So I couldn't <laughs> exactly find uh, his original paper, but uh, it is very well known. It's a very famous result. So um, Badin proposed the first example of a regular black hole that only violates the global hyperbolicity. So, so the metric looks like this spherical symmetric shape and FR is one minus the blah, blah. So um, you can easily check that this satisfies the null energy condition, but uh, there is no singularity. If R goes to zero, then you can notice that all the covered quantities are finite. So this is regular in the sense. So um, then how can it be regular and what is the causal structure? And uh, you can notice that uh, FR equals zero uh, and corresponds to the horizon, but uh, there are two solutions. So this is the same as the, the, the Rison Nordstrom black hole. So uh, here is the outer horizon. Uh, uh, let me uh, draw uh, my other color. So uh, here is the outer event horizon. And here is the inner horizon, inner Cauchy horizon. So there are two horizons. And uh, in the uh, Reinsel Lodestrom black hole case, R equals zero uh, is the time like singularity. But in this case, R equals uh, zero is regular, interestingly. Then uh, what's the difference? Because um, um, we cannot decide this R equals zero hypothesis from the past data. So, uh, you know, uh, S1 is the um, hypothesis of the past geometry. And this will decide. So from this data, you can consider the evolution of all the data based on the equations. And where causally um, uh, decided is, um, I mean, the causal, um, uh, causal triangle is uh, this region. So you can decide this inside the, this triangle, but uh, you cannot decide this, this part. So um, that is the violation of the global hyperbolicity. So if a global hyperbolicity is violated, then there exists uh, some space-time region that you cannot decide from the past data. So there should exist the uh, Cauchy surface. And then, uh, no, no, I mean, not Cauchy surface, I'm sorry. Uh, there must exist a Cauchy horizon. And uh, beyond the Cauchy horizon, you cannot decide. So, but it is in, not inconsistent to, to the singularity theorem because it violated the, the, um, the um, it violated the, the global hyperbolicity condition. So um, this is a very, uh, so in the market, in the research market, there are very many proposals of the um, uh, regular black holes, but uh, they share the, almost the same uh, properties. So typically they have two horizons and typically R equals zero is regular, timelike and regular, but uh, typically they violate the global hyperbolicity. This was discussed in the um, paper of Bourdais in uh, 1997. 
So uh, based on this um, static solution, um, can we uh, give, provide any dynamical descriptions? And, and maybe the simplest way is to uh, introduce uh, the Vedia approximation. So by keeping the, the static metric, but only changes the mass parameter. Then uh, as time goes on, um, initially there was a noble record and due to the um, gravitational collapse, uh, maybe inner and apparent, inner apparent and outer apparent horizon grows. And um, due to the uh, Hawking radiation, uh, they uh, approaches to the extreme limit and eventually um, disappears. And then um, in the entire space-time structure, there's no singularity. So therefore, uh, you can draw, you can, so we hope that we, we, we may draw this kind of causal structure. And in this causal structure, the, the center is always time-like. And um, in the entire causal structure, there is no formation of the singularity or nothing strange happens. Therefore, there is no way to lose the information. So maybe uh, somebody says that, especially in GR community, people prefer to explain that it, it may be sufficient to explain the information loss paradox. So this picture was introduced in, uh, by the Hayward, the, the famous Hayward model in 2005. However, um, there are many uh, things to, that we need to discuss. First one is that um, we need to introduce the Vedia approximation. But um, is the metric description sound or not? We need to think about this. And the second one is that anyway, the, the regular black hole model uh, is just uh, the metric model. Uh, this means that there is no uh, explanation in terms of the energy momentum tensor. The energy momentum tensor must be the, the um, construction of the matter fields, but there is no such an explanation. So it is somehow a very a phenomenological uh, description and there is no, no well-defined justification. And finally, you may ask uh, whether, if, anyway, if this causal structure is right, then is it sufficient to explain the information loss paradox? And uh, maybe not, <laughs> because, um, you know, um, so then you may ask um, how can the page cup behaves and, and so on. So, um, if you apply the page curve idea and package time hooking entropy formula and so on, then uh, still, uh, even though there is, there is no singularity, it is very subtle to explain the information loss paradox. In this and case, then, uh, how this uh, original argument of the black hole complementarity can uh, apply? This picture. Uh, I mean, uh, I if, if there is no singularity, like the uh, original one by uh, they using the some singularity like uh, some importing observer jump into singularity he will just vanish so who cares but uh, in this case if there is no singularity there's right. still like a couple like a complementarity so, uh, I think, uh, I think uh, this picture if this picture is right then this is very opposite to the black hole complementary because uh, all ingoing observer will eventually meet as at uh, asymptotic infinity. So there is no definite distinction between inferring observer and asymptotic observer. So I think this is a very uh, opposite side uh, of the black hole complementarity. I mean, opposite side means kind of okay. a counter eugenical? Oh, right, right, right. I think so. Okay. All right. Okay. okay. So um, if this picture is the case, then maybe causally it's okay, but uh, there are many suspicions. Um, so then in principle, there can be two problems in terms of the Vedia approximation. First, it ignores the detailed dynamics of the intermediating geometry. So between uh, outside, the outside is almost twice, but inside is regular. So the, 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 there must be a justification of the intermediating geometries from the energy momentum tensor, but there's no justification from the field theoretical or meta field side. And, and second, even though we assume the metric form, um, but, uh, but uh, still the, it is, we cannot sure whether um, the Vedia approximation consistently describe the evaporating uh, geometry. And in addition, um, for the inner horizon, near the inner horizon, there may be the instability behavior, so-called the mass inflation. If it is the case, then uh, we cannot trust the geometry beyond the inner horizon. 
So um, by keeping these two uh, questions, uh, maybe uh, about the first question, how, how can you justify the metaphysical side? Maybe one um, answer is that if you introduce the uh, thin shell formalism, then maybe we can partially explain the metaphysical issue. This paper is based on prologue of Marco Fermi in 1991. So um, in this um, uh, another regular of record model, um, they consider the uh, cut and paste technique, but uh, outside is a supersymmetry and inside is this stuff. And but uh, the interesting point is that the cut and paste technique was applied inside the horizon. So uh, it, it is the the space like hypersurface. So you cut space like hypersurface and uh, paste between physical space and supersymmetry uh, black hole. Then um, all space time is um, seems to be regular. And um, you know, so and we can easily explain the enrichment of tensor. So inside is a twister, outside is a schwarzschild, pure schwarzschild, and only the matter contributes at the, at the uh, space like a shell. And probably the shell tension and pressure can be explained by the matter field constructions. So uh, if we introduce this kind of model, then I think it, it becomes a little bit uh, physical in terms of the energy and tensor. However, then the question is, can you apply the, this thin shell model um, to the Vedia approximation? And uh, in, in my recent paper, um, I carefully consider the dynamics of the space-like shell. So, um, so I mean, um, so using the same technique of uh, my previous paper with Bill on and so on. So we applied this for the um, Vedia metric, which has um, a force vacuum lump inside the black hole, and then through some dynamics. Then uh, my conclusion is that uh, if you solve the Vedia, Vedia uh, calculations based on Hawking's uh, evaporation formula, then um, you can explain this part, this uh, yellow and green colored part. So uh, if you are an ingoing observer, then you will see a time-like regular center. However, this is no more true for the outgoing direction. If you uh, change your trajectory to the outgoing direction, then uh, it is very probable that you will definitely see the singularity in this time. So uh, this means, so what, what does it mean? And uh, this means that um, unless the, the, the evaporation is very rapid, um, uh, the apparent horizon very quickly approaches to uh, null direction. But uh, at the same time, this uh, initial in inside the shell um, doesn't approach to the apparent horizon uh, rapidly. Therefore, um, there must be a space between this horizon and the shell. And of course, this must be the, must be the space like singularity. So um, my conclusion is that it is not very easy to um, if, if uh, the intermediating matter is a physical matter, then it is uh, very difficult to resolve the um, singularity, even though um, um, the static solution has no singularity. So this was my conclusion. So, um, so the real dynamics is much more complicated. So maybe there is a, one, another way. So um, now, if we, we don't change the global hyperbolicity, but if we change the matter conditions, um, but but um, uh, you know, um, null energy, violation of the null energy condition is not easily justified. But if um, it, the justification comes from the quantum gravitational corrections, uh, then then maybe this can be justified. So uh, without using any exotic matter, can quantum gravity provide such a natural example of the regular black holes. That is maybe a um, natural next question. Then what do you mean by the quantum gravity? And um, of course, and there are several trials to quantum gravity. The most uh, dominant uh, approach is uh, string theory, but string theory is uh, basically a perturbative description. But uh, near the singularity, we need a very non-perturbative uh, descriptions. And maybe one famous candidate is the loop quantum gravity approach. So um, uh, of course, um, um, uh, uh, of course, um, almost all listeners of this uh, classroom is about uh, string theorists, and also I'm not an expert in, in the string. I mean, the quantum gravity side. But um, if I <laughs> very briefly explain 
what uh, is going on in the quantum gravity side. Then um, it is uh, about the Hamiltonian approach. So um, this is a non uh, non perturbative uh, description of the um, um, gravity and all the matter fields. So the main aim is to uh, solve the constraint quantum constraint equations. So first. Um, we solve this Hamiltonian constraint equation in the quantum version, and the other is to solve uh, momentum constraint equations. So basically, uh, we have uh, four constraint equations. One is Hamiltonian constraint, and the other is three uh, momentum constraint equations. Or, or these momentum constraint equations are known to be the Diffeo morphism constraints. Diffeo morphism constraint. So um, for the so for very simplified examples, if you impose the symmetry of the space time, then you can easily neglect the diffeomorphism constraint, and you can only focus on the simplified version of the uh, Hamiltonian constraint, which is known to be the the Hilbert weight equation. This this is known to be Hilbert weight equation. However, uh, uh, in general, you must consider all the constraints, including uh, field width and uh, different morphism constraint uh, equations. And then um, what um, people uh, proven is that um, so this theorem is known to be a lost theorem, L-O-S-T. Lewandowski and O, -O I forgot name O, and Salman and Tiemann. So this four, um, uh, mathematical physics have proven the theorem. Um, so the, the meaning is that um, if you quantize the space time based on the, the uh, direct quantization scheme, then um, there is the unique uh, representation of the different morphism constraints, which is uh, known to be loop quantization, loop, loop representation. So, of course, um, uh, about the mathematical meaning of the loop representation. I can uh, explain today, but but uh, there, so anyway, what I want to emphasize is that there exists a um, theorem such that uh, for the most generic um, representations, um, it it can be um, it must be the loop, kind of loop representation, uh, which satisfies the diffeomorphism constraints, and th this is a unique choice. So there is no other way. So in this sense, this is a very uh, generic proof about this approach. And then the next test case, based on this uh, representation, we need to solve the um, field weight equation. Now, this includes all the dyna quantum gravitation dynamics of the space time. That is the approach of the loop quantum gravity. However, the problem is that uh, this field weight equation is horribly complicated. Uh, so um, you could find the diffeomorphism constraint solutions generically, but but field weight equation is much more complicated. So um, we need to reduce the space time smaller and smaller. But uh, we hope uh, this case some some contributions of the um, of the uh, diffeomorphism constraint and loop representations and so on. Uh, so uh, that is the effective um, uh, model. So some what I know is this paper. Uh, because uh, I also contributed this paper. So uh, uh, based on this paper, uh, details are discussed. So uh, based on the uh, spherical symmetry, um, the basic um, strategy is that you present the space time uh, based on this kind of metric ansatz. Well, um, of course, you can present metric by various ways, but uh, this metric is uh, known. So these variables are known to be the, the uh, Ashtika variables. So if I and EX are um, presented by the Ashtika variables, and this N is the left function, and this NX is the shift function. So left and shift explains the, um, uh, the variation of the left and shift functions are um, related to the Hamiltonian constraints and the, the momentum constraints. So uh, there is NX, and due to this NX, uh, there are just the, um, um, the momentum uh, constraint equations. And uh, thanks to the loop representation, uh, you can um, effectively modify the, the, the Hamiltonian of the space time. So this is the Hamiltonian, and um, uh, F, there appears F1 and F2 functions. So if, uh, if uh, this delta parameter goes to zero, then it becomes just the classical Hamiltonian of the uh, space time. But uh, due to the um, 
uh, loop uh, corrections or more mathematically, this is known to be polynomial corrections. Then uh, this Hamiltonian, uh, classical Hamiltonian is mod modified by these functions. And uh, thanks to these modifications, uh, maybe this uh, solution can be uh, singularity free. So, but, but uh, we, hope, we hope that uh, this model is singularity free, but uh, we need to solve and check whether this is really the case or not. So from the, this Hamiltonian uh, equation, um, no, no, I mean, we did, from this Hamiltonian, you need to derive the equation of motion and you need to solve it. And then this is the numerical result. Uh, and, if, and even you can uh, find some some uh, new, uh, analytic solutions, but this is the numer um, I mean numerical solutions. And um, uh, this is the conclusive the, the final uh, causal structure that we obtain. So the outside geometry is required, but uh, the interior geometry is extended due to the. Uh, excuse yes. me. Yes, yes, yes. So in the Hamiltonian. Yes. The previous page. Yeah. Pre yeah. So could you explain the where the origin of delta is? Delta. Ah, the origin of delta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, this comes from the loop representation. So, mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, I mean, the representation is somehow the most general representation. And uh, this is somehow some, some, something like, uh, so in order to satisfy the uh, momentum constraints, uh, all the solutions must be presented by the, uh, something like the Wilson loops. So, so it, does it correspond to uh, conserved quantity? Or uh, so, uh, I, I, so, so I'm, I'm not very familiar to this. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. But, but, uh, I just wondering. Yeah. yeah, so um, I, I think so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but uh, I, I'm not uh, very sure about the exact meaning of uh, the, the yes, recent yes, loops. Yes. But, but okay. the Thank loops you. is presented by loops, and this is the minimal length of case. Mm -hmm. okay. So, due to this, um, there, so if you go back to the classical geometry, then we obtain some effective action, something like this. Mm -hmm. okay. so, so, this is a um, contribution of the effective action. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay. So, but but um, I'm not a very good expert about this, so <laughs> maybe I'm, I can be wrong. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, you can uh, extend the space-time geometry even inside the uh, black holes. Then uh, you obtain a very similar geometry of the uh, very similar space-time uh, of the Baden-like black holes. However, um, uh, there are many subtle issues. So I couldn't uh, extend more uh, about uh, uh, this uh, research topic, but um, I will not say about the subtle issues. Uh, but apart from uh, our discussions, there are several other very radical proposals from the loop quantum gravity community, which was first one is Hegat Roberry model. So in the Hegat Roberry model, um, they uh, obtained this kind of geometry. So there appears some quantum tunneling, quantum bounce. Uh, uh, from the black hole phase to the white hole phase. So there's a transition from black hole to white hole, but uh, such a transition um, covers not only inside, but also outside the horizon. So you cut and paste the space time even outside, outside the horizon of the black hole. So um, in my knowledge, there is no justification in this paper. So in this paper, it's, it was just a proposal. And um, but but um, in my opinion, uh, this proposal is even wrong because um, uh, so in this paper in 2018, I take I, I um, reconstructed this kind of geometry based on the, the general relativity and tensile technique. So by using the correct um, cut and paste technique, um, you can uh, reconstruct the, the same causal structure. But the uh, the the cut and paste surface should reach it not only near the horizon, but also it should reach it to infinity. This means that if there is a, such a, a quantum transition from a black hole phase to the white hole phase, then um, it should affect even asymptotic infinity, but it is very improbable, I think. So, so um, I, I, I think um, this paper, I mean, the Hagar Hagar building model uh, is not very physical. It's just only hyper. Uh, hypothetical model. Maybe a better theoretical model was proposed by Ashtek, Olmedo, and Singh in 2018. Uh, in this model, um, they more uh, constructively include some 
corrections and solve the effective record solutions. Um, and they obtained another regular record solution, but the space time is a little bit different from um, the previous um, Brahma, Bozoal, and his model. Because um, so there is a transition from a black hole phase to the white hole phase. phase. I, uh, so, so there is a, some transition surface, and um, you can directly enter the black hole phase to the white hole phase. And there is no inner current horizon. So this is the, somehow the new feature of this architectural model, same model. So uh, there is a transition from a black hole to white hole, white hole inside the horizon. So in, you know, in the Hegatorovary model, it was the outside, but uh, in uh, architectural model, same model, AOS model, um, the transition was inside the horizon. So maybe um, this may be on, also an interesting toy model. And originally uh, in this paper, in this paper, I want you to uh, compute some some quasi normal modes or any any astrophysical applications of uh, that regular black hole model. But uh, what we noticed is that indeed the solution is problematic. So the solution is not asymptotically flat. <laughs> so originally the metric form was very complicated, but eventually we noticed that it, it is not asymptotically flat. And if it is not asymptotically flat, then the, the metric is very strange. And uh, later, um, uh, interestingly, uh, this title paper was um, appeared, so comment two on the, the paper of um, AOS. So uh, I, I think uh, the, their original model uh, is uh, somehow uh, problematic. And uh, in this paper, we wanted to criticize the paper, but um, uh, this paper was rejected by many, um, many journals because um, we against the very big guys, very famous paper. So <laughs> our paper rejected several times, but even to republish it some journal. But, but we noticed that, um, yeah, it was quite uh, difficult to criticize some uh, mainstream. <laughs> but anyway, this is a joke. Uh, so uh, eventually, um, we noticed that uh, this original version of the solution is not asymptotically flat and maybe uh, not very consistent. So, but still, there are many uh, new uh, researches in this field. So, uh, LQGX in inspired regular black hole is now on actively de developing a research topic. So, there may appear later fully consistent quantum gravitational uh, regular black hole model soon. But I'm not entirely sure, but there may appear soon, and maybe we can discuss its applications in terms of astrophysics and so on. However, um, still, um, philosophically, you may ask so. Uh, if we do the correct quantum gravity, then we need to see the genuine uh, wave function um, uh, behaviors inside the black hole. But um, why should it be still classical? Uh, why should there be a, a corresponding classical geometry? If it is the uh, genuine quantum gravitational phenomena, then maybe the more correct description uh, is the more um, some wave function and quantum mechanical description. Uh, you may think about this. So about this um, issue, um, recently uh, we discussed some interesting proposals. So uh, as a reference, let me just uh, shortly mention about this. So uh, this is about the canonical quantization for the inside of the uh, black hole. So, um, so the interior of the Schwarzschild black hole can be described by this kind of metric form. Um, this is not new because um, um, you, you know, for the inside of the uh, Schwarzschild black hole, the metric should look like this. So metric should look like this. Inside of the black hole, um, R is uh, less than 2M. Therefore, uh, the signature is changed. So this and 2M minus 1, T R square plus R square, T omega square. This is the inside of the Schwarzschild space time. And uh, you know, uh, now this is positive, this is negative, and this is positive. Therefore, uh, uh, indeed, this uh, T rules the radial direct coordinate, and R, R is the rule of the, um, uh, uh, the temporal coordinate. So uh, I just change R to T and T to capital R. Then um, the solution is changed to be t t square divided by some some function of t plus uh, 
I said t is is a t. Two r minus one. No, no. Two m minus one t uh, r square plus t square d omega square. Something like this. And uh, eventually, you can notice that uh, there is a function of time. There's also another function of time. There's a, yet one another function of time here. So there are three functions of time. But uh, you know, this is a lapse function. So you can freely choose, choose uh, this lapse function by discarding uh, the time parameter. Uh, then uh, the physical quantities are about well, these two metric functions, f and g. So uh, for the interior of the black hole space time, um, the space time described by this way, and uh, this geometry is very similar to the analysis group cosmology. So, so by redefining some variables, you can present this way. So function of uh, t here and another new function y here. Uh, but uh, why should we present this way? And if you present um, two independent metric um, functions by this way, then um, eventually, uh, this system, uh, the, the Schrodinger equation of this system uh, can be separable. I mean, the, um, the separation of variables is possible if you choose the canonical variables by this way. So uh, this is the classical solution, xt equals this and yt equals this. This is just the Schwarz static solution. So this is the, um, just the classical solution. Uh, it's related to x and y coordinates. And then um, by using the two x and y variables, these are now canonical variables, and you first write down the uh, Lagrangian of the, um, um, of the Einstein action, and then you introduce the resultant transformation, and you obtain the Hamiltonian, and you quantize, you change the momentum variables to the operators. And then you will eventually obtain this kind of wave equation. This is the period um, equation that we need to solve. And then, uh, you know, this, um, uh, this partial differential equation is very simple. Uh, so you can introduce the separation of variable, and it is very easy to find the most generic solution. Uh, the generic solution should have this kind of form, uh, where um, fk is the, you know, so we have to sum over all allowed um, momentum. So, then, then there must be a coefficient fk. So this is the most generic solution. And it, this fk must be decided from the boundary conditions. The boundary con physical boundary condition means that uh, the solution um, must be classical, so must correspond to the classical solution at the horizon. So near the singularity, of course, it can be quantum, or whatever, we don't care. But uh, near the horizon, it must be classical. So by imposing this, um, um, nice boundary condition. You can uh, solve the, the, the uh, wave function and indeed you can obtain a very well defined um, probability distribution. So this is the um, psi modulus square and you will obtain this kind of this um, behavior. And then uh, there is a, uh, uh, there is a behavior of the wave and uh, this red curve is the, the steepest descent of the system. So this means that um, there is a one classical part, one classical path here. So uh, let me draw this way. So there's a one uh, classical branch here. There is a one new classical branch here. And around this region, uh, steepest descent moves um, di differently. So the probability um, changes. So around this region, there is a quantum bounds. So here is a classical branch. No, let's say one. There is another classical branch. Branch two. So there are two classical branches, and they are bounced at the quantum bounce, uh, bouncing surface, which is r approximately m. So um, there may be two interpretations. So, so uh, by the way, uh, this um, steepest descent well um, corresponds to the uh, classical trajectory solution, Schwarz's solution. So this indicates the so-called LMFAST theorem. So the, the uh, peak of the wave function should uh, follow the classical trajectory. So, uh, that is related to the LMFAST theorem. 
So anyway, uh, so there are two um, so branches of the classical tools. So, so one is here and the other is here. But um, in the field of approach, there is an ambiguity to decide the error of time. So if there is only one error of, error of time, then uh, this wave function explains the just the classical evolution of the space time from horizon to the singularity. This is the first interpretation. But if uh, the space time has two arrows of time, then one approaches from horizon to uh, the bouncing surface, then the other starts from singularity and approaches to the bouncing surface. So maybe the interpretation is something like this. So there are two arrows of time and they are crunches at the bouncing surface here. So, so there are ambiguities to decide the arrow of time, then you, we may interpret, um, so if you interpret the first way, then um, nothing new happens. It's just the classical evolution. But if you choose this second way of interpretation, then maybe it's more, um, a little bit very, it looks very crazy, but it, it seems more interesting because um, two pieces of the classical space-time crunches set a surface and um, disappears somehow disappears. So, um, so you know, in, in uh, quantum cosmology, uh, Hawking and Hartley introduced the notion of the creation from nothing. So this means that um, thanks to Euclidean um, manifold, universe can be created. So here is nothing. And quantum fluctuation creates uh, the universe from nothing. However, if a time flows opposite direction, then maybe the quantum mechanical in some space time can be annihilated um, to nothing. <laughs> so from, not from, but uh, to nothing. So uh, maybe if this interpretation is allowed in quantum gravitation case, then maybe we can um, make a nickname opposite to creation from nothing. This is uh, annihilation to nothing. Maybe this interpretation can be uh, possible for the inside of the black hole. So if this interpretation is possible, then definitely information must be disappeared. So it must be the non-unitary evolution. So I don't know whether um, this uh, is um, perfectly correct interpretation or not. There are many subtle questions. So uh, this is the starting stage and we need to develop more about this direction. But uh, anyway, the quantum gravitational understanding of the singularity must be to an important role for the final answer to the information of paradox because it is um, described about the infer problems. So um, to summarize um, up to now, what I said is that uh, there are several approaches to study the infer problems. Uh, one is about the effective uh, geometrical approach, which is the regular black hole picture. And the original regular black holes can be provided by many sources. For example, one can violate the um, global hyperbolicity, or one can violate the null energy condition uh, from some quantum gravitational corrections. And um, the second approach is the quantum gravitation, I mean, uh, wave function approach using field equation. And um, still, there are many software issues, and we need more development. But as a common sense, I, um, I hope to remember you that there are such um, investigations. So uh, let's move to the remnant picture. So if there is a regular black hole, then it is believed that uh, there are two horizons. Then uh, as King um, edition evaporates, if uh, these two horizons are approaching, then uh, this will approach to the, 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 the extreme black holes. Then if, if extreme black hole is perfectly stable, then it will become a remnant. So um, there are many proposals um, in terms of the remnant um, scenarios. So, uh, there are really many proposals. So, in this paper, uh, in this paper, uh, in this review paper in physics reports, uh, we summarized the very uh, various approaches uh, towards the black hole remnant, remnant scenarios. So, um, um, I hope uh, for the so even though you don't believe the black hole remnant picture, uh, I hope you uh, briefly search if you want to know about the historical information about the uh, remnant approaches. So um, about this topic, I will summarize some contents of this paper. So uh, what is the motivation of the remnant? Uh, the first one is about the logical possibility. Uh, if the Beckenstein-Hawking entropy is not the same as the Boltzmann entropy, 
then even though Bekenshian King entropy is very small, uh, there can be a very huge Boltzmann entropy. And then this may um, reconcile the tensions between the five assumptions that I have mentioned. Then uh, this means that all the information are stored in such a very small object. And, and then um, um, if the small object reveals the information uh, at the last stage of the evaporation, or if uh, uh, the, the remnant carries all the entanglements from outside to inside, um, but it never evaporates, for example, then um, this can explain the information which paradox by some way. That is the basic motivation of the black hole remnant. However, um, this idea is criticized by many ways, and I will discuss it later. Um, however, uh, even though uh, the remnant is nothing to do with the black hole information of paradox, but still um, uh, we need to um, study its, the possibility. Uh, even though the, the remnant scenario is not the true answer to the information of paradox, perhaps the remnant can be the final state of the black hole evaporation. So in the final state of the black hole evaporation, it goes to the quantum gravity regime, and we don't know what will happen. Uh, so um, one of the most popular possibility is that it completely evaporates and disappears. That's a possibility, but um, it may be possible that the Hawking temperature somehow decreases near the Planck regime, and um, um, it becomes a stable object, maybe quantum gravitational residue of the space-time. Um, maybe this can be a logical possibility. So we don't know what is the um, real case. So even though it is nothing to do with the information of paradox, uh, this can be the last st stage of the black hole evaporation. So uh, maybe we need to think of, we need to keep this logical possibility for the future applications. So what is the theoretical way to go toward the remnants and indeed um, in um, my uh, review paper, we classified by three uh, routes. The first one is from the quantum gravity. The other is from the modified gravity. So uh, by quantum gravity, what I mean is that the, base, um, the, the principle comes from the quantum gravitational one. Um, modified gravity, what I mean is that um, uh, anyway, um, there are some higher order gravitational corrections or modification of the corrections, but we deal the space time um, with the classical way, purely classical way. So, so the second one is the modified gravity way. The third one is uh, from the modified matter. So I mean, uh, if uh, there are some additional charges, um, some, some unknown hidden charges exist, then this can provide some charged black holes. And then charged black holes, the, the final stage of the charged black hole must be the extreme black holes and extreme black holes may be the zero temperature and it can be stable. Uh, so uh, that can be on a, another candidate of the black hole remnant. So uh, if you see more details, then uh, in terms of the quantum gravity side, maybe the most somehow um, brief idea is the uh, generalized uncertainty principle. So if you introduce the generalized uncertainty principle, then there is a minimal length. And thanks to this minimal length, uh, there is the end point of the evaporation, and then this becomes the a kind of the rem candidate remnant. And, and um, there are also other candidates, um, regular black hole, what I have mentioned, and the quantum gravity inspired black holes that I have mentioned, or um, non-commutative non um, um, theory inspired black holes, which is also regular. And um, I, I forgot whether it's regular or not, but this also provides a remnant solution. And from the non-local gravity, it allows remnant solution and uh, uh, RG modified gravity also. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, this is a renormalization group learning some inspired modified gravity models and, and rainbow gravity model is also one candidate. And also Horabari, Hotabari's gravity model also provide the uh, remnant uh, solutions. So there are many, um, uh, interesting approaches, but, but this doesn't include the string theory, I think. <laughs> but, um, but, but there are some alternative approaches, and from many approaches, uh, maybe the end point of your evaporation can be the remnant. So if you uh, follow the modified gravity approach, then um, there can be several different approaches. Uh, Dilaton plus 
higher order curvatures, which is, um, is related to the string inspired gravity models. And for some string inspired gravity models, uh, there are some remnant solutions. Or the rubber lock gravity, which includes many um, terms, including Gauss Bonnet term and uh, some topological invariant terms of the higher dimensions. So this is known to be the rubber lock gravity. And um, or um, string inspired 4D gravity case also, it's known that there are some examples uh, such that um, some remnant like solutions are possible. Or palatine gravity or and so on. There are many or examples. So, um, oh, okay, <laughs> and finally, the, from the modified metal side, uh, there are some uh, extreme black hole solutions. Um, so, from the particle physics side or string inspired theory side, there are many conserved charges and they can provide many kinds of extreme black hole solutions. Or maybe there can, if there are many additional vector fields from various motivations, then this can provide many modified, um, also, I mean, extreme black hole solutions. Or uh, dilaton charge coupling uh, may provide also um, uh, some non trivial uh, extreme black hole solutions. So, one of the uh, famous examples, uh, so, so um, the famous in stringy black hole solution is known to be uh, Gibbons Maida solution. Gibbons and Gibbons, Gary Gibbons and, and Casey Maida's solution was a, a very generic solution. And one of the class is uh, known to be the um, I, I forgot the, the, the name of Horowitz Strominger, ah, ah Kaffinkel Horowitz Strominger solution. Um, so, what I mean is uh, Dilaton charge coupling cases that um, the, includes the Kaffinkel Horowitz Strominger solution. So, in this case, this is the magnetically charged black hole solution, but um, in the extreme black hole limit, the space time looks uh, regular. And, and it seems uh, to be an uh, extreme black hole with uh, zero working temperature. So um, many people had the interest about this um, capping towards strom in the solution anyway. So no, indeed, there are many um, examples, and not only um, quantum gravity approaches, but also inspired from the string theory side. So there are pros and cons. So in quantum gravity side, the pros is that um, some or some if there is a minimal length scale then it is very natural uh, to conclude that uh, thanks to quantum gravity the final state final state of the uh, black hole evaporation must be such a, a minimal object minimal length object so in that sense this is very um, consistent and intuitive very intuitive uh, and it can be very generic but the problem is that um, there is no dynamical description in general so, you know, um, regular black, maybe loop quantum gravity is a little bit, bit better, but except for this, um, um, even loop quantum gravity side, um, it is very difficult to do the full quantum gravity. So every approaches are very effective and there are lots of approximations. Um, therefore, um, so we don't have a, a very good uh, dynamical descriptions of uh, all the black holes. So, so many things are very hand wavy. In the modified gravity side, so this is the gravity theory. So we have a definite action and we know how to derive all the, all the equation of motion. Therefore, uh, the modified gravity models are in, the, in principle uh, um, very cl classical and we know uh, the um, uh, equation of motion and everything is very theoretically uh, consistent. That is a very uh, strong point of this approach. But the problem is that um, in order to obtain the remnants, you have to select the action very carefully. So, you know, um, in string inspired models, uh, there are dilaton coupling with many higher order curvature terms. But uh, if you choose um, higher order curvatures very randomly, then there may be no remnants. So, in order to obtain the remnant solution, you have to select a very specific contributions, um, which is very um, um, non unnatural. <laughs> so, 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 so that is the weak point of the modified gravity side. Uh, and, and in the in the modified method side, um, 
maybe this is free from all the um, all the problems of number one and two. So um, in the modified meta side, we have dynamical equations, and also um, we don't need to select very um, strange choice of the um, actions. So if there is a matter, then it is very natural to expect that there is such a extreme black hole solution. It, this is very natural. However, the problem of the modified matter side is that such an additional charge um, can be escaped from the black hole, not by the hooking mechanism, but by the Schrodinger-like mechanism. Therefore, um, if there, even though there is extreme black holes, they may not be perfectly stable object. Therefore, if they are not perfectly stable object, then um, it is very unclear whether it can do a correct role for the um, remnant of the space time. So this is the, somehow the weak point in terms of the modified metal side. So anyway, this is just a brief summary of various uh, route toward the um, remnants and um, and many possibilities. So there are many criticisms uh, to the remnant picture. If you believe that such a remnant resolves the information loss paradox, then uh, you need to assume that um, such a very so somehow whatever it's a big or small uh, anyway, such a small object should carry almost infinite. Um, entropy, or, uh, I mean, almost infinite Boltzmann entropy must be stored in such a very small object. So um, um, maybe you can assert that, um, why not? <laughs> or maybe you can ask why not, why it is impossible. But um, at once you accept this possibility, then um, there must be infinitely many species of such an object. So it has too much entropy. And this means that there are too many species of such an object. And then um, from the vacuum fluctuations, uh, it can be populated, it can be uh, nucleated. So because um, there's a, uh, so usually the um, production probability is exponentially suppressed. So, so in general, it is not easy, not easy to see such a um, quantum gravitational populations because it's exponentially suppressed. But uh, if you have infinitely many species, then it simply diverges. So if it diverges, then from the vacuum, you must see infinite population of the infinite pop up of the um, remnants, but we don't see at this moment. So, so this is inconsistent in terms of the uh, observations. That is the uh, the most uh, natural and important criticism toward the remnant picture. Uh, in my opinion, uh, this is a very reasonable criticism. And it, even though uh, <laughs> you may say that oh, there may be some unknown principle that prevent such a um, production of the remnants. So you may argue that um, um, you may bypass by some unknown principles. So even though one bypass the problem from unknown principles, um, However, I think that at once a remnant emits information, then this may repeat the inconsistency issue of the black hole complementarity once again. Uh, what I'm saying is that, so at once such a remnant emits the information, then um, you can uh, consider the secondary collapse of the matter uh, near the um, such a remnant. Then uh, the classical size of the black hole um, can be uh, a little bit bigger. Uh, than the Planck scale, but um, this um, state stage must be beyond the page time. Uh, so because I, I said that um, at once the remnant emits information, then this means that the combination should be beyond the page time. And then um, uh, you make you can make it as a semi-classical black hole, uh, which is beyond the page time. And then <laughs> um, the, now the Hawking addition, not remnant emission, but the Hawking addition uh, should carry the information, and then um, and this may cause the problem once again. I think um, the pro so maybe we should see the uh, the 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 fire paradox once again. So uh, in this sense, um, maybe uh, one can uh, one can insist that. Uh, one bypass the problem from unknown principles, but um, if it is the case, then um, such a remnant must not uh, emit any information. That is my opinion. 
So uh, if the information, uh, and anyway, if the remnant carries almost infinite information without emission, then uh, how can you explain this? Uh, do we need uh, any um, mechanism to uh, explain such a very huge uh, entropy inside such a small object? Um, so, for example, if uh, there is a very small uh, horizon area, so A is order one, but if the interior entropy is very big, so I mean this interior entropy is much big, then um, and this is known to be the back of gold geometry. Uh, this is the object that carries almost all uh, entropy, but uh, the horizon size is very small. If there is such a geometry, then uh, this is um, uh, known to be the back of gold geometry where the world uh, came from um, John Wheeler. So, <laughs> If we have such a bag of gold geometry, then maybe one can explain, but what is the mechanism to create such a bag of gold geometry? Uh, maybe uh, one alternative candidate is the baby universe. If uh, a baby universe is created inside the black hole, and if it's the um, size of the baby universe is, is very big, huge, I mean, if it in starts to inflate, uh, and um, if the size of the baby universe indefinitely increases to infinity, then maybe such a process uh, is possible. But of course, you may ask eventually, is it generic or not? <laughs> um, so of course, we, what we know is that it cannot generically happen. So um, maybe it's not very generic, but um, even though it is not very generic, if uh, it is logically possible, um, then maybe we need to think for which mechanism a baby universe can be created inside a black hole. So uh, about this research topic, the most important papers are these two. So Farigus Gubun in 1990 and Pistler and Morgan Polchinski in 1990. So at the same time, they obtained the, the same result by using a different technique. So this is the paper of Farigus Gubun in 1990. And the title is um, this, is it possible to create a universe in the laboratory by quantum tunnel tunneling? So title is very uh, fascinating. Can you make a universe in your laboratory? <laughs> so um, this is a very fascinating question. And um, the um, answer is probably yes, but the price is the probability. If you pay the price, then you can obtain such a maybe universe. And uh, at, the, at almost the same time, so it's a, it is published. Uh, I couldn't see the date, but um, this is, is published in uh, 90 April. Um, and uh, you know, this the first version was published in rapid communication. So uh, I think uh, Pistol Morgan Polsinski hurried to publish this result in order to compare with Farigus um, Gubern paper. So it's interesting. Uh, and uh, they use the WKP approximation. So uh, if a first, the, the, the idea is this. So how can you obtain a universe in the laboratory? Um, whatever, my laboratory or your, your desk or anywhere, <laughs> can you do it? And um, if a first vacuum lump is uh, nucleated and uh, if uh, the size of the bubble is greater than a critical size, I mean, if the first vacuum bubble size is greater than the, its cosmological horizon, then um, an inflating universe can be created from the realm. Uh, so, so we, what I'm saying is that uh, we need two conditions. One is that um, you need to prepare a first vacuum bubble. And the second condition is that the, so the size of the bubble must be greater than a critical size. Then uh, you can introduce the inflation and then due to inflation, you can obtain a new universe. However, the problem is that uh, due to the singularity theorem, uh, such an inflating bubble cannot be prepared from classically regular conditions. So at once um, the bubble uh, inflates in indefinitely, uh, then you can go back all the time. And then uh, thanks to the singularity theorem, there must be the initial singularity. However, in, in, in your laboratory, if there is no naked singularity, uh, then uh, you can, this means that you cannot prepare this kind of uh, um, uh, conditions by a classical manner. So, so uh, due to the singularity theorem, uh, 
uh, such a verb will cannot be prepared if uh, the initial condition is classically regular conditions. Then, um, uh, what, what is the alternative way? So either you start from the singular conditions, but, but of course it, is, it doesn't make sense. Then the alternative way is to change the classicality condition. So what we need is so we need uh, help from quantum mechanics. First, we prepare a small force vacuum bubble, which is not excluded from the singularity theorem. If the, um, small, if the bubble size is very small enough, then of course um, it, you can create in principle in the, your laboratory. And then if the bubble tunnels from a small size to a very huge size, then um, it is not a classical evolution. So it's a quantum evolution. And then, um, so if you consider such a tunneling from a small bubble to a large bubble, then um, um, even though there is a singularity theorem, you can still uh, build an evaporating, uh, no, no, I mean uh, inflating universe inside your laboratory. So this is a typical um, tunneling process. So this yellow colored region is the um, inside the bubble and the, the, the green colored region is outside the bubble. So uh, of course, um, this, this curve is connected to the naked singularity, but maybe you don't have to worry about this. So in your laboratory, uh, let me uh, draw this way. In your laboratory, you can prepare a um, small and uh, buildable bubble uh, here. So it's uh, outside the surprise horizon, and also inside is a small, um, small bubble. But um, due to the quantum tunnel tunneling, this bubble increases uh, from small bubble to uh, large bubble by the tunnel in this way. And uh, at the same time, um, in terms of general relativistic analysis, um, this shell cannot increase to the large bubble at this point. This is disallowed um, due to the general relativistic discussions. However, this shell can tunnel beyond the einstein rosen bridge. So, so the shell tunnels from small to big um, bubble, but uh, it goes the beyond the einstein rosen bridge and can expand to infinity. Now, uh, this bubble um, size becomes uh, greater than the cosmos horizon and uh, you know, it inflates. So there appears the space-like infinity here. So, so this is the basic interpretation of the tunneling process. And uh, for the same process, Farigus Gubun used the Euclidean path integral approach and uh, Fisdal and Morgan Polchinski used the uh, canonical approach, I mean the Hamiltonian approach and they applied the WKD technique. So uh, two approaches um, some coincided reasonably, but uh, there were several some, some subtle issues. So in the Euclidean path integral approach, we already chose the, the overall um, uh, sign of the action because of the Euclidean path integral. But in the canonical approach, there is the overall, I mean, sign ambiguity. So, so there were some, some subtle issues, but except that uh, two approaches uh, look uh, very consistent on each other. So, so they obtained the same uh, result. And in the Euclidean domain, the initial shell, shell so, uh, um, moved to this way. And so the, on the Euclidean manifold, the shell moves to some um, very complicated passes. So, mm, but, but anyway, in principle, you can uh, interpret in terms of the Euclidean instant ones. So uh, physically, you may interpret this way. So outside is a sparse suit and inside is was a visitor. And initially, it was a small vacuum. But it tunnels to a large vacuum. So uh, I mean, large bubble from R1 to R2. This is the tunneling. But after the tunneling, um, now uh, this shell is located beyond the einstein rosen bridge. So here is the event horizon. And uh, the shell is now located um, beyond the einstein rosen bridge. And then this shell uh, can uh, inflate indefinitely. So this is the mechanism of Farigus group um, or Fisler Morgan Pulchinski process. OK, so then maybe in principle, you can build an um, inflating universe inside, maybe inside the black hole. Um, I, if you can say inside, then it's um, inside the black hole. Uh, or you may say it's uh, beyond the einstein rosen bridge. Maybe you can interpret this as inside the black hole. So that is OK. Uh, 
Uh, but um, at once this process appears, then inside the black hole there appears a very huge universe. And such a huge universe seems to have a huge entropy. However, if um, information must be preserved, then it seems to be very inconsistent because uh, entropy must increase due to this um, crystal and Morgan Pulsinski process. So uh, there appeared uh, this paper by Frey Vogel, Shubeni, Maloney, Myers, Langamani, and Shenko. The, the title was Inflation in ADS Shifting. And in, in this paper, uh, they considered the, the first vacuum dynamics, first vacuum bubble dynamics in asymptotic ADS space time. So their interpretation is that if uh, such a tunneling, particles driven tunneling happens in the ADS, asymptotic ADS space time, then uh, it, uh, the evolution it must be non-unitary. So in terms of the unitarity of the ADS CFT, um, it must not be allowed. So if this process is possible, even in the ADS background, then the entropy purely increases and hence it must not be allowed by ADS CFT. So, but in this paper, they um, insisted that um, um, such a process is not, must not be allowed due to the ADS CFT, but um, there was no constructive explanation why such a process is impossible in terms of the Euclidean uh, uh, quantum gravitational way. So, so um, it was a very um, uh, subtle. So even though there was a criticism, it was a little bit subtle. Uh, and uh, um, a little bit recently, um, there appeared another paper. So quantum transitions between Minkowski and distance space time and also uh, Gularis, Munia, Pasquarella, and Quevedo. I think also these authors are quite famous in string theory side, and their interpretation is a little bit different. So um, there is an opposite opinion that even with the ADS-CFT um, correspondence, uh, the particles given Husserl Morgan Polsinski process can be allowed. So the process is allowed, but still um, uh, it may be consistent to the ADS-CFT correspondence and so on. Mm, and I don't know <laughs> what is uh, the true uh, interpretation about this. So I think that there is no um, constructive reason to uh, deny or disallow the Farigus Gugun, Pistol Morgan Polsinski process. So uh, then this means that if there is no um, reason to uh, disallow, then theoretically it must be allowed. Then uh, we may need to ask what is the consequences of such a non perturbative process in terms of holography, ADCFT, and the information loss paradox. For example, uh, if, if bubble universes can be created inside the black hole, or um, if we can consider the Euclidean homers in string-inspired models, then is it still consistent to the, to the unitarity of the um, um, unitarity of the quantum mechanics and or um, uh, what is the implications of the information of paradox? So is it still consistent to the, to the uh, ADS safety, con ADS safety correspondence and so on? So still, um, uh, in my opinion, uh, these topics are still um, um, not very clear to me. And maybe there can be more interesting future research topics. So it's about the end of the time. So let me finally remark very uh, shortly about the future perspectives about the information loss paradox. So I think briefly speaking, um, um, so I, up to now I discussed many um, different topics here, this and that, but um, toward the ultimate understanding, uh, we need three things. First, uh, we need to know uh, which principle of the nature must be modified by a um, well-defined and constructive way. Um, I mean, the justifiable way. So which, who is wrong? Uh, which principle is wrong? We need to answer about this. And then second, we need to know the constructive mechanism to take out information. You know, so if there is no loss of information, this is the second important task. And, and then third, uh, we need to know the des uh, destiny of the, the infolium observer toward the singularity. So whether the, the infolium observer uh, dissolved near the firewall and emitted by Hawking addition, or uh, in the infolium observer touches the singularity, or the space time extended beyond the singularity by some quantum gravitational way, or whatever it is, and we need to answer about this. I think um, 
we need to um, answer about the three questions uh, together um, in order to um, um, reach the ultimate understanding of the information loss paradox. And I believe that since several decades, there were um, indeed many uh, developments and uh, many um, progresses about uh, um, these uh, problems. So um, I think um, although we didn't uh, reach it, the ultimate answer of the information loss paradox yet, uh, but uh, there have been many improvements. And then I believe in some day we will know more and we will know better. And eventually, I, I'm not sure, but eventually we will reach the ultimate answer about this in fascinating um, paradoxes. So uh, maybe I have uh, two slides more. Uh, so two slides are about the experimental test because what we are studying is the uh, physics, which is about the nature. And of course, um, um, the situation is not very optimistic um, to um, uh, confirm or hypothesis based on the experiment. <laughs> so this is not very optimistic, but uh, still there are some possibilities to experimentally demonstrate several hypotheses. For example, um, if you rely on some, some quantum gravitational ideas, uh, either string theory or um, any other approaches, then uh, maybe one interesting, um, um, interesting um, uh, income in terms of experimental side is the cosmological or astrophysical observations. They can provide uh, some clues about uh, quantum gravity or quantum cosmology. For example, um, so, so uh, you know, this is the CMB uh, data analysis um, from um, Planck, um, Planck mission. And um, almost all things are very well explained by the Lambda CDM plus single field inflation model. But um, so there are some, some, um, uh, some systematic error um, for the long wavelength mode. But uh, such a long wavelength mode corresponds to the, the earlier um, fluctuation of the inflationary phase. So uh, this may, uh, or may or may not, I'm not sure, but this may in include some, some uh, early quantum gravitational uh, effects. And maybe this may some window um, to probe uh, quantum gravitational hypothesis um, based on the, 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 the cosmological observations. Uh, of course, maybe not. <laughs> so uh, this is, I'm, may or may not, but this can be an um, interesting window. And the other is about the cosmological other observations. For example, um, um, in my best knowledge, uh, the, the data prefers a little bit phantom universe, something like this. So if omega zero is exactly uh, minus one, then it is not a phantom, but a data pre prefers that, that the universe is, um, no, 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 not phantom, but um, some data prefers the phantom-like universe. So. Uh, I, I don't, I mean, we, we don't, sure. So probably um, it, it's a very strange, but if um, there is, are, uh, appears some phantom-like phenomenon in cosmology or astrophysical situations, then maybe this can um, be the test for to, to um, um, uh, prove or disprove some hypothesis. Also, um, uh, if there is a membrane near the black hole, and if there appears some gravitational, I mean, black hole um, collisions, then um, maybe you can see some um, echoes from um, the gravitational waves, and maybe you can see something. So, <laughs> anyway, all of them are still very hypothetical and very, very speculative. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, all of them are very speculative, but um, we need to imagine what can be the observables um, that demonstrates the. Um, quantum gravitational hypothesis. And, and um, in terms of the black hole physics, uh, maybe analog black holes can be a um, new um, candidate to experimentally demonstrate uh, semi critical radiations. So uh, this is the LHC figure. And several years ago, uh, we expected whether the LHC can make a black hole, mini black hole or not. Uh, so strongly motivated from the the, the, the brain world scenarios and large extra dimension scenarios, but now um, it's almost um, in, so now we need to conclude that in LHC there is no black holes. <laughs> so uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, still, uh, if you if we if we make uh, even huge accelerators, then 
maybe in future, I'm not sure near future or not, but in future, maybe um, we may uh, make a black hole in, in laboratory. Well, of course, this is very unrealistic, but um, so there can be some other experiments. For example, uh, this person is famous um, uh, researcher who, who um, who experimentally demonstrates the, the analog of black holes using the Bose Einstein condensation in the low temperature. So they, he, he said that he could see the Hawking like radiation from the analog of black holes, but um, it is not uh, well accepted by the other colleagues. But, but uh, still, and there can be a such a possibility to experimentally demonstrate those possibilities. So maybe the, the LIGO can be, LIGO or future uh, gravitation wave experiment can be, can find any signals about um, black hole physics or uh, this is the, the uh, moving mirrors. So this idea was proposed by, pro, pro, proposed by uh, Pisin Chen, who was my previous supervisor, I mean, I mean uh, previous host of uh, my postdoctoral position. And uh, Pisin Chen uh, wrote a paper with Gerard Muru, uh, who got the Nobel Prize. In, and uh, Gerard Muru is an uh, uh, expert in laser physics. So they built an idea that in the plasma medium, if you shoot a strong laser, then a mirror is created. So it's already well known, well established fact. And uh, if you design the, the plasma medium very um, consistently, then uh, the mirror can accelerate. So if the mirror accelerate about the speed of light, then it can emit some hawking like radiation due to the uh, semi analysis. And uh, at once you create such a mirror, then um, you may uh, demonstrate some ideas of the um, um, information loss paradox. Of course, uh, this is a very opti optimal, I mean, um, uh, optimistic um, ex expectation. And of course, there are many obstacles to for the realistic experiments, but um, we need to imagine many things. So if we, we don't imagine nothing, then there will be no outcome. So um, I hope um, some of you also imagine a very interesting experimental trials to uh, demonstrate any um, quantum gravitational uh, assumptions. And then in some day, we find a very, um, hopefully in some day we find a nice way to um, prove or disprove some ideas about the information paradox in them. Okay, uh, that's all my preparation and thanks for uh, your listening. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for a great talk. And uh, first, please uh, ask any question. Uh, probably, I think you mentioned the the question from the chat, but uh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, there is uh, some a question in the chat. So name of the okay. So so I I, I saw uh, uh one question uh that is um um who is the Postdoctoral mentor. Ah, uh, yes, yeah, so it's in Chen, Pisin Chen in uh, National Taiwan University. And also, there is another question. Uh, oh, oh, oh. The third and the fourth. Oh, no, not that PC Chen, but let me, let me write. Let me uh, reply <laughs> here and uh, okay. There is a question. Can you explain a little bit why CMB experiment can give insight about black holes and baby universes within them? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, for example, uh, this is just my my um, um, uh, private opinion. But um, so let me uh, go back to my final slide.
Okay, so uh, you know uh, uh, this uh, long wavelength regime uh, corresponds to the, the earlier um, uh, perturbation, earlier fluctuations. So uh, if inflation lasted more than 50 equaldings, for example, eternal inflation case, then the quantum state in approaches to the uh, bunch Davis vacuum, and then uh, this already uh, erases all the initial uh, data. However, um, we are not sure, but in, uh, if it happened to be such only uh, 50 equaldings. Um, from the uh, nucleation of the universe, uh, then um, at such a, uh, at, at a very early stage, um, there can be some uh, effects from the um, uh, quantum gravitational scenarios. For example, uh, if the universe is created from the big bounce, then um, some, there can be some um, bias from the bunch Davis vacuum uh, near the bouncing point. And such a, um, fluctuations may, um, effect to the, 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 the I mean, spectrum, uh, spectrum of the um, uh, density perturbations. Uh, or if you choose another um, wave function, for example, hot rocking wave function, then um, again, uh, the, the, um, you can see a different um, um, spectrum. So, so uh, by the, the analysis of the spectrum, maybe in principle, you can um, demonstrate some um, quantum gravitational hypothesis. So that is, um, uh, my um, my meaning, uh, but the problem is that still we have a very small window, and also um, uh, from the beginning uh, it is very the, the error bar is very big. This means that it is very difficult to uh, experimentally uh, observe more better um, things. Uh, so so uh, maybe technically limited, I think. Uh, any other question? Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, so, for example, I mean, measure of the Hawking radiation, maybe also there is just some limitation of our like uh, experiment or instrument or our uh, limitation to measure something. Right, right, right. Like, uh, there is a lot of noise or so also on. That's right, that's right. So probably in the Hawking radiation from our galaxy, it you cannot, is it? Possible to measure the Hawking radiation or uh, so so. <laughs> from uh, astronomical and, records, I think it's uh, impossible because the temperature yeah. is too small. So, yeah. uh, so uh, mm -hmm. uh, then what about the meter case? Uh, it is still like uh, you said, uh, it moves the speed of light, but uh, uh, of course, if, even if there is uh, some black radiation, is it uh, enough to measure the Hooking uh, that some radiation and the distinguish it from the noise. So for for uh, I mean for uh, some uh, for which cases I I think in astrophysical cases it's uh, almost impossible to detect Hawking radiation. But in analog black holes, uh, indeed it's not real black hole, but it's a system which has uh, some horizons. For example, the sound horizon, so of the acoustic medium. And then uh, from the near the sound horizon, um, so I'm not expert of the field, but in my understanding near the sound acoustic horizon, um, the equation of motion is very similar to the black holes. That's the reason why people think there can be the black hole like uh, emission, hooking like emission. So, so this, there is a trial to see such an emission, but then in order to make it, um, we need to decrease all the noises, uh, all the thermal fluctuations. But, um, and the hooking radiation is anyway very tiny. So that's the reason why uh, um, the experiment is very difficult and um, not many people are believing the result. So, I mean, in detail, like uh, some how, which order, or like uh, maybe it depends on the, the acceleration of the mirror. Uh, for the mirror case. Uh, mirror case, I'm asking the mirror and uh, this is radiation from the mirror is it measurable in the Fred's colleague or maybe uh, 
so, so I, I'm not an expert, so I'm not sure. But uh, in my uh, in my knowledge, uh, usually um, there is a background temperature. So unless you control the background temperature, it is almost uh, it must be very difficult to figure out the hooking radiation. So um, I don't know how to <laughs> do it. Okay. it um, I, I don't have any feeling about the, the typical temperatures. But the, these people are expecting that they can measure. Uh, so uh, this, this is uh, just a theoretical proposal. Uh, I, this, uh, just a th theoretical, not the experimental. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, there's a, so no, oh, I see. Uh, uh, for this case, there is an experiment. And for this case, um, there is no experiment yet. It is a uh, theoretical proposal. Any other question? Uh, can, uh, can you explain uh, uh, back when the um, w w when there would be the the, the, the run or at the um, at CERN, there was a, there was a fear that this, uh, this experiment would generate a massive black hole. I don't know if you remember those scenarios. And I couldn't understand why um, an electron-positron collision experiment would generate a massive black hole. Do, do, uh, did you remember these... these um, these scenarios before the final runs at CERN? Uh, I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't uh, listen clearly. So uh, could, could you explain once again? Yes, you, you remember when CERN was about to do its big run at the, the, um, the, at the Large Hadron Collider, the, the, the LHC, there were, there were speculation that there would be a giant black hole that would, would, be, would be created by those, those beam collisions at CERN in Geneva. In, in, um, and and I, I never understood why would a black hole be generated in these um, electron-positron collisions. Ah, I see, I see, I see, I see. So, you know, in LHC, for example, so particles are collided, then of course, um, the typical energy scale is um, tape scale, which is way smaller than the Planck scale. So, uh, in, so, in, in, uh, so it is almost impossible, but um, there are some uh, scenarios from the string theory that if uh, the, the extra dimensions are um, very big, um, compared, compared to the Planck scale, for example, then, then um, the effective um, Planck scale becomes the tap scale. So that is the point. So, uh, so the point is the effect. So for some uh, scenarios of the exterior dimensions, the effective Planck scale increases. So which um, I mean the effective uh, Planck length um, increases or decreases, but but the, the, the Planck energy um, it decreases up to the tap scale. If it is possible, then then maybe some black hole like something can be created even in the tap scale. So I, I think that is the idea. Thank you. Okay. And uh, is there any other question or comment? If not, uh, let's uh, thank uh, Professor Dongwan Yeom for the great six lectures. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>